count from, you know, January to June, that you hear in the words multiple offers is pretty unheard of. Right. Unless it's like a super unique property or in a super nice place or at a super low price point, but kind of across the board, we weren't hearing multiple offers a ton. Uh, so surprisingly in the last two months, you know, I, I've been on the buyer side, uh, you know, where we're fighting against multiple offers. And then I just had a listing go live last week, right? Mobile home out in the country, sitting on an acre. We get multiple offers the first weekend. So you think there's anything to that? Is it multiple offers just across the board or is there a particular price point? Like, I think it's the affordability factor and okay. it's always relative to the area, right? So affordable in Del Valley is different than affordable in South Austin is different than affordable in Zilker. Gotcha. Right. So if you're below whatever that market value should be kind of in that given area, if you're on the affordable side of that, be ready for multiple offers because there's people who've been dying to get into that area. They're coming to terms with their own interest rate. And now there's a property that's just a little bit cheaper than everything else in that area. They're going to jump on it. And mm-hmm. there's at least a pool of folks who are ready to, um, you know, so, you know, and, and we, my listing was out in Cedar Creek. Our price point was 280. That's pretty low. Sure. But, you know, here in Austin, here in especially like 78745, right, South Austin, if something's in the low 400s, it's snapped up like that. You know, it, yeah. it's quick. And I'm sure in Zilker, it's, you know, if anything ever hit the market, you know, 700, 750, there's somebody ready to jump on it. Whether yeah. it's an investor or a homeowner, either way, if it's below that kind of market value area, you're going to get into multiple offer situation because of the affordability. Right, right. right. And again, it's, it's relative. People are in different situations. They have different jobs. But if you're looking at a specific area, be on the lookout for deals because everybody else is too. <laughs> you know, everybody wants a deal. Everybody looking for a deal. That's the one thing we've definitely covered. Is uh, it's all about the deal, right? And and that's where a good real estate agent can really go above and beyond. One to find any coming soon's that may be hidden gems or diamonds in the rough. Right. That's a that's a very good thing if you're if you're a prospective buyer and you're looking for a place make sure you're with a good agent because if they have the connections in the area that you're trying to be and they get a little bug in their ear that something's coming that's going to be a little bit cheaper than everything else yeah that's a great opportunity versus somebody who only sends you the stuff that just came out and you know it's just all over the place right if you have somebody who's kind of really tapped into that local area that you're trying to get to that's going to go a very long way um, and so that, you know, whenever those prospective buyers are trying to find a good agent, you know, talk to somebody, make sure that they're very knowledgeable and, you know, have experience in that area to one, even know what affordable is in that area. Right. Because me personally, I live in South Austin, but I branch out of Georgetown. So I'm a little bit, you know, away from yeah. where, you know, if somebody comes into Georgetown office and they're asking me about stuff in Georgetown, I may not be the most knowledgeable person to give them what is a good deal in Georgetown. But if they come into South Austin and come into my neighborhood, I know exactly where that line is. I know where the line in the sand is. If it's below that, let's jump on it because it's a great deal. Yeah. Right? And, and that goes a long way. Interesting. I got a good one for you here that uh, I haven't asked anybody yet. And I think that uh, I think a lot of people need to know this one. So we see a lot of stuff in this area, a lot of new builds, right? You're seeing a lot of new builds coming up and, uh, a lot of people are really enjoying the whole building situation because they're giving away a lot of incentives, you know, mm-hmm. seller paid closing costs, all these other things, which I guess we can talk a little bit about that later. But what I've seen a lot of buyers do is they go in and they feel like they're going to get a better deal if they don't go in with a real estate agent. And so what I wanted you to kind of touch on is what is the importance, if any, of a buyer using a real estate agent? when they are interacting with a builder and buying a new build? Please, please, please remember that the person that is sitting in that office that's showing you these beautiful brand new homes and telling you all this good stuff, that's not your real estate agent. That is a builder's representative who is directly tied to sell that home for the best price so that way his boss, the builder, makes the most money. So while the numbers may look good and it may feel like you're getting a good deal, you cannot forget that that person's, you know, as real estate agents, we have fiduciary responsibilities to our clients. That means putting our clients above all else. That's what that builder agent is doing for the builder. So if you don't have anybody batting in your corner, 
you may think you're getting a good deal, but you could have got something else. You could have got the washer, dryer, fridge thrown in. You could have got the landscape package, or you could have got the upgraded countertops because that person knew what that was worth. That buyer's agent knew what you could get. And so you had that conversation up front versus the other side where this builder's agent, hey, they're doing their job, right? They're not trying to pull any wool over your eyes, but their job is to make sure that the builder gets the best deal, not you. So where do you think the misconception comes from? Like why, why do you think that buyers, and obviously we know it's, it's a lack of maybe education, but like where, where did it come from to where a buyer thinks, oh, you know, I've been looking at houses that are existing homes with my real estate agent, but now I'm going to go look at new builds and I'm not going to call him or her because I'm going to get a better deal. Like where does, where does that mentality come from? You think? It's about understanding where the commission comes from. And so when you're buying resale, yes, part of that price has a baked in commission to it. Now it's my understanding that on the builder side, the commissions are a little bit different. They come from a different pool of money. They're not directly from the sale of that house. They come from their realtor budget, right? So right. It's two. To- they have a home and a build budget that all these numbers do all their own things, and that's totally separate than bringing somebody else in. And the easiest way to point that out and to, to make it known that you're not necessarily getting an advantage going in by yourself is because some builders are even offering double commissions to outside real estate agents to bring their buyers in. Yeah. Why would they do that if it was better for a buyer by themselves to come in? Right. It's because one, there's value in having a buyer's agent and it's a better feeling and you have more more conviction with your choice if you have somebody that's batting in your corner and advising you. But the builder wouldn't be, they, if, if it didn't make sense for a builder to pay real estate agents, they wouldn't pay them at all. Mm-hmm. And if you're paying double, well then clearly there's a reason one, it's because we're tapped into more people than they are because we're out in the field and we're working with buyers that are all over the place. But two, we help protect buyers' interests. And ultimately, sure. if you don't have somebody fighting in your corner, you're going to get beat up. Two versus one, that's a hard fight every time. You know? <laughs> right. <laughs> sure. You know, if you get into a physical altercation, it's one versus two guys. Who do you think is going to win? Yeah. No, yeah. that makes sense. It, it's it's And not to any fault of the builders, a lot of the times they're going to tell that you know, incoming buyer, hey, if you come here, we'll give you a little bit better price. But in reality, again, right, that buyer's agent commission is going to come from a different bucket of money than your sale price of your house. Gotcha. Well, now I kind of want to speak to sellers a little bit. And, you know, one of the questions that I, or not questions, but one of the things I hear a lot when I, when I talk to potential homeowners that are thinking about buying the currently own a home is they'll, they'll make comments like, well, I want to kind of get a feel for what I can afford. I'm looking at maybe selling my home six to 12 months from now. And then from there, I want to buy a new one. I just have some home improvements that I want to complete first. And then I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to list my house. And what I've been told is that you might be making home improvements that might not be best for what you're trying to accomplish. I mean, at the end of the day, everybody is trying to get as much money for their home as possible. But if you're going to invest money into a home improvement, you're going to want to make sure that you get it out. Right. You got the return. So I, 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 you know, I kind of like look to you right now, as far as is there, are there home improvements that you feel are just absolutely necessary that need to be done? If so, what are they? Um, and then I would envision that some of them are on a case by case scenario and you would encourage, encourage anyone to have a real estate agent come and look at it. But are there some, kind of tried and true things that if a buyer says, yeah, I'm going to do this to my house before I sell it, that you're like, yeah, hundred percent, you've got to do that. Like, right. You know, what are your thoughts? So, and I'll speak specifically to South Austin. So a lot of homes here have not been updated since the nineties. If you are like, you know, myself, we live in a home again, that has not been updated since the nineties. So the easiest kind of low hanging fruit of stuff that would definitely raise your value is the stuff that's mostly cosmetic. Now, at the end of the day, you don't want to go above and beyond and make it super personal because most likely somebody has their own preference, right? If you love blue and so you paint your whole house blue inside and out, well, then if you go to go on the market, you spent 10 grand to paint your whole house blue, Mm -hmm. but you go on the market and you're like, well, somebody's going to love it because I love it. 
that's a disconnect, right? So keeping it neutral and keeping it kind of necessary, right? So definitely painting. And if you're going to paint, try to keep it neutral so that way somebody coming in can still put their own spin on it. Stay away from the stuff that's super personal and what you love. Because at the end of the day, it's not about you. It's about you making the the best clean slate for that incoming buyer. Um, master suites, you know, master bed and master bath, that definitely goes a long way. If you're willing to upgrade your bathroom, put nice countertops, a new toilet, a new walk-in shower, that's going to recoup its investment because people love nice master suites because ultimately i'm buying a house i want to be comfortable in there i want to feel yeah. good about that purchase That's where you spend most of your time right, right yeah yeah bathroom and yeah in the bed eight right? hours a night if you're lucky <laughs> yeah i mean half of our life yeah is going to be in there um and so i think master and also kitchens now mm-hmm. again in the kitchen let's keep it pretty modest let's not go above and beyond that's super super specific to what you love but upgrading appliances new countertops. It, it's the stuff that's functional. I think anything that's functional is worth putting the money into. Anything that is preference or simply cosmetic is not worth it, right? So if they're going to use that area of the house, that's worth it. But like you spending the money to install a bunch of floating shelves in a guest bedroom, probably not going to be worth it. It gotcha. may look good and you can ha- put all your nice books but if the next person's not a book lover and they don't have their own library, they're going to take it out anyways. So they're not going to pay you the extra 5000 that you paid for it because they don't care. They're going to take it out anyways. You know? I see. And, and so I, I think that's the main way to look at it, right? If it's something that's functional, you know, kitchen, the master suite. I'm a big backyard person. I think a nice deck or a nice landscaping in the backyard, I think that can go a long way. Um, pools, that's a big chunk to chew on, right? I think if you were putting all of your money to try to go a pool, you're probably not going to get your money back. I know everybody's going to love it, but they're just so expensive to install yeah. that you're not going to get it expensive all Expensive to back. maintain, too. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, it's keep it functional, keep it necessary, right? People like outdoor living. People like a nice kitchen. People like a, a nice master suite. Those are things you should focus on, not so much all of, all of the other stuff. So, so to be clear... If I were like, oh, I'm thinking about selling my house, do I have to do the kitchen? Do I have to do the bathroom? Like, if I have a budget and I'm like, I know I want to get top dollar out of my home, and you know, let's just say I've got a, a a budget where there's no way I can do everything that you just listed. Is there one thing out of everything you made mention of that is probably the most important? I think the most important would be. Okay, let's go budget, right? We have a low budget. We want to get the most bang for our buck. I think interior paint and new floors. Paint. I've been told <laughs> that was kind of a trick question. Everyone, every real estate agent has said paint. And what's interesting to me is that in addition to that being the obvious answer, um, one of the things that a real estate agent made mention to me that I didn't even think about, it was in addition to paint, just kind of brightening things up. It looks clean. It also gets rid of a lot of smells. So if you've got pets or maybe you're a smoker, all of the things that, you know, can create issues when people are walking through the house, nothing is better than walking through a freshly painted house. It It smells like a new house. It feels like a new house. And so, yeah, that's why I say floors, right? Because carpet holds whatever's in there. Yep. And I've been in houses where you get halfway up the stairs to the second level. And you know they have cats. And you know they (laughs) have. We went into one and there was a little hall closet on the way to the garage and we see this little hole sitting in the bottom like what is that and it's got a little cat ear and i'm like oh no you open it up it's a cat house you're like what is going on in here (laughs) you know so uh, yeah i mean again right new paint gives it that new house smell new floors stops the old floors from stinking up the place right that's going to go a long way um you know and giving people that new that fresh that ah this feels right is a lot better than you know, trying to do a bunch of abstract stuff. No, I like uh, that. I had a house that I was selling and it definitely needed, you know, paint throughout the entire house, right? It'd been like five years since I had painted. And I remember when I was selling it, my agent, I said, you know, put in the like notes that I'm willing to paint the entire place before, you know, the new buyer moves in. I just didn't want to paint the place a color 
that they didn't like. That they didn't like, mm-hmm. right? So we, you know, the the house went live, and we had, gosh, probably like twenty five or thirty showings in like three days, and nobody wrote an offer, right? And we're like, what the heck is going on? You know, and this is during like a fairly competitive market. And my real estate agent was like, I'm telling you, you've got to paint. And I said, look, I'm agreeing to it. It's in the notes. Like, I will paint. It's just I don't want to paint and have somebody either not like it or I'm just a weird person that, like, me spending money to paint and then someone buying it and spending money to paint paint over over it, it. to me, just is like (laughs) wasting money in general. It doesn't matter whose money we're wasting. And uh, she goes, nope, you've got to paint. So we go in. We paint the entire house just like you know, the real estate agent, Sherwin-Williams, repost gray, you know, the color of, like, 2020. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And uh, the house literally sold the next day, all because of me painting it. We're in the game of perceptions. It's crazy. I mean, it was it, it blew my mind, like, that coming in, fresh coat of paint, smells like paint, feels new, that's all that it took. And, again, it wasn't like I was – fighting it because i wasn't willing to pay for it Mm -hmm. i just wanted someone to come in and say here's the colors that i want to paint everything and Mm -hmm. you know write an offer and we we do it right and that's where first impressions for a buyer goes a long way they go in and they hate the color of the house they're not in their mind thinking okay well it'd probably take about 3500 maybe five grand to paint the whole thing they're thinking that they hate the color of the house right if it's already been painted okay well Hey, I may not love the color, but at least I don't have to worry about painting it right this second. Yeah. And you have a different look, right? Their perception of going in, ah, oh, this is nice, or, ah, oh, man, this needs to be painted. That little bit, the second they open that door and see new paint or old paint or old wallpaper or, right. you know, like my house, we still got the super thin wood walls, you know, like that stuff will turn a buyer away quicker than anything. Buyers else. just don't have good imaginations. Right. That's what you're saying. Well, I mean, they <laughs> they have it, they want it there, but it's subconscious, right? It's yeah. just we're all, you know, we're beings, right? We're perception we, our yeah. reality is out in front of us. You walk into some place, it's going to give you a vibe, and if that vibe is nice and clean and new, that feels a lot better than this place smells like old, old house and I need to paint. You right. Know? Um so definitely that. Well, that's like I always, you know, in my younger years, I always kind of thought staging was kind of silly. You know, I felt like people could go into an empty house and kind of envision themselves living there. But then after my whole paint debacle and then, you know, some of these homes I've seen just staged so nicely. You were and I were at that broker's open a few weeks back. A few weeks back. And Mm -hmm. I mean, that house is completely staged and it looks great. Like, it doesn't look staged. It looks like someone lives there. The furniture's Mm -hmm. cool. Everything's, like, but it's completely staged. And, you know, I I, I see it all the time with buyers that are like, oh, I'm not paying for staging. It's a waste of time. It's a waste of money. But kind of what we just touched on with the whole paint thing, it's, it's, it's wild how much that can really make a difference and how much you can potentially, you know, get your money back and then some in terms of selling. The best way to think about it, and I saw a Twitter video, a YouTube video, the guy took an old Coke can. You put it in a dumpster and it's trash. But you put it in a museum with white walls and a glass case around it, it becomes art. Yeah, it's vintage. It, it's not <laughs> so much the tangible product, but the environment that it's in. Mm-hmm. And houses are no different, right? A blank house gives you a blank feeling, but you walk into a house and it feels like a home. It looks like a home. You can see yourself living there. Yeah. Um, you know, so, I mean, that's, that's what I, I love that. I loved watching that video. I was like, that's exactly the value behind that. Right. Like it's all about environment. It's about the, uh, you know, again, right. Perception when somebody walks in, what does it feel like? What does it look like? What does it smell like? Let's use our senses here. If I touch the wall, do I have popcorn ceilings, right? Popcorn ceilings is another thing. If you're a seller, get rid of them, <laughs> scrape them off, get them redone, whatever you got to do, because, you know, we're we're all about our senses, right? Touch, smell, sight, feel. Right. Like those things matter when somebody's walking into a house and whether or not they're gonna fall in love with it. Gotcha. Well, I mean, outside of everything we talked about, are there any topics you wanna cover? Anything you wanna go over? So yeah, so I was sitting on a call and, and somebody asked me and it kinda stumped me, so I wanted to try to see if I can stump right you. Again, there's no wrong answers. Yeah, but, no, not at all. Um I, I love hearing what you gotta say. So if I'm a buyer 
and I come to you and I say, how's the market? What do you say? <laughs> I mean, the market is what it is, right? I actually had this exact conversation before we started this, and we were talking about rates and everything along those lines. And the buyer actually said to me, you know, I, I want to buy right now. And, uh, for, you know, personal reasons and it, it's time for her to buy. And she kind of, we talked about the fact that, you know, when if interest rates go down after she purchases, we can refinance her. And she basically said to me, you know, it's a good time for me to buy. It's, there's things going on in my life. This is what I'm doing. And at the end of the day, I don't have any control over interest rates. And so I'm not going to let that stop me from, you know, achieving my goals and doing the things that I want to do. And when she said that, I said, I love that attitude. And you know, what's interesting is that you said you don't have any control over interest rates. Neither do I, <laughs> right? Like Absolutely. neither do I. Everybody thinks you're the bad interest rate guy. And it's like, go talk, go call the government, right? Call right. 411, see if you can gripe to them and get them lower. You can. And, and so when people ask me like, how's the market? I think that, I think the real question to that question is like, you know, how's the market compared to what? Right. Like compared to 2020, compared to 2010, compared to what it's going to be in the future, because that answer I can give you right away. I don't know. <laughs> That's the easy one. Uh, yeah. So it's all I mean, it's all relative. I, I, I think at the end of the day, the one thing that I've been harping on on a lot of these podcasts is I think that if you own a home right now and you're considering buying another home, that's a that's a much more loaded question. It's it's more of a debatable topic. But if you don't own a home and you're thinking about buying, better yet, I don't even care if you're thinking about buying. If you don't own a home and you can afford a home, you absolutely should buy um, as, as soon as you can. And it doesn't matter what the market is because you're missing out on basically an opportunity to what I call just kind of like get in the game. I mean, real estate is a casino. And the one way to make sure you never win in a casino is so don't play. Don't play. And outside. you have to live somewhere. And unless you are going to tell me that, you know, well, I live rent free because I live with my parents or um, I don't know other, any other rent free situations. Viable but reason. right. Unless you live legitimately rent free, if you're paying for housing, you should absolutely own a home. And, you know, even if it's like, well, you know, I don't need a big house. It's just me. Like there's options for that. And I even encourage young people like find a roommate. There's a lot of people that can't afford to buy a home at all. And if you can, you should. Um, it kind of is a nice segue into one of the topics I wrote down here, which is, you know, everyone, when it's how's the market right now, to me is a question that someone would ask because they want to find out if I'm going to tell them that there's a better time to buy than now, right? Because I can always tell you there was a better time to buy in the past, but I don't have a time machine. And, and we can't go back. So that, that's irrelevant. So... Anyone who's asking me that question is asking me because they're wondering if I'm going to tell them to wait. And what I know for a fact is that when interest rates go down, for example, or even if property values come down a little bit, it's going to, in it's going to increase buyers. And we're going to find ourselves in more multiple offer situations. And what I think a lot about is somebody who currently owns a home, when they sell that property, they're going to... They're going to profit on it. Not only are they going to get back the portion that they paid down from their mortgage for their monthly payments, but they're also going to get the appreciation on the property. And what I have seen firsthand is if I take two buyers, one buyer who doesn't own a home and one buyer that does, the one that does is going to end up selling his property and he and he or she or he and she or whoever is going to get that money. Let's just call it $50,000 that they got from buying a home. Where this other guy selling the home, selling the home, excuse mm -hmm. me. Where this other guy is going to come in now, and let's say he, I mean, he has no equity, but let's say he's got fifty thousand dollars in a money market account. Well, now they both have the same amount of money that they're willing to invest into their new home. The difference is, is that the person with the home who accumulated this equity and the money that they've paid toward their mortgage are much more aggressive in making offers and typically end up getting that property because I don't know if it's human nature, but liquidating an account of hard earned cash is way more difficult than money, just, you didn't even think than money that you, that, that you kind of just made through appreciation for paying in a house that is a roof over your head. Right. And the reason that I bring that up is because it goes back to the whole 
first time home buyer or if you don't own a home, why it's important. Because I don't care if you're socking money away into your savings, you will protect that money more than the equity that you will accumulate by, by, simply, own, living by simply living in a home. Mm -hmm. And when you go to make offers and you go up against that couple that's got $50,000 worth of equity that they just want to transfer into their new home, but you've got to pull $50,000 out of your 401k or your IRA or whatever financial account you have, I promise you they're going to beat you because they've got the stomach for it because that 50k of equity is like monopoly money to them. Because they've already paid for it. Right. And let's be super honest. Most people don't have 50k in an investment account. <laughs> well, that's true. You know, and so if say those exact two scenarios, one person bought a home a few years ago, this person hasn't. They work at the same company, they have the same job, they're the same performers, same credit, same everything. Like two totally identical parties trying to buy a house. Simply them having owned their house puts them in a better position to get the next one. Right. Because they don't necessarily, they can't hold on to that money. I mean, yeah, of course they could bank it, but the point is to get the next house. So why not take all of it, every single penny of the money that they acquired through uh, appreciation and put it straight into the next one? It's just like, you know, getting a new car. You roll over whatever equity you have into the next one because you're going to be living in the new house. Why would I just bank the money? Why I can put it into the next one, right? This guy has none of that. And well, and this is what I ran into in like 2020 when, you know, we had all these crazy multiple offer situations. I had buyers that were so frustrated. And I remember one buyer in particular that flat out said to me, he's like, you know, that house that I wrote this, this offer on, it went for $100,000 over asking with like a $50,000 appraisal gap, which for the record, for those of you that don't know, it's like if the house doesn't appraise for what the asking price is, the difference has to be brought in cash. And the guy said to me, like, who has this kind of money, right? And in his mind, I think he kind of, like, at first thought, in his mind, I think he was thinking, like, you know, who are these rich people that have just, like, a hundred grand sitting in how a checking made, account? Yeah, how much money do they make a year to right, have an extra right. hundred thousand to throw? But the truth is, is that these buy it was buyers that were selling their houses and getting this equity from another property. They weren't like cutting a check out of their checking account or anything like that. And it makes me want to just say to people who don't own a home, like become that buyer that the other person that doesn't own a home is going, who has this, who kind, has of this kind of money? Right? Right. right? Because if you talk to people who bought in like 2019, 2020, 2021, I mean, this is just two years ago. And with the appreciation that we've saw, seen over the last few years, if you bought a five, six, seven hundred thousand dollar home, you probably have six figures of equity in your house right now. Ready to be used. Like, there it is. Like, I'll tell you who has that kind of money. Other homeowners that bought before you that didn't go, oh, I'm going to wait until it's a good time. Mm -hmm. They're the ones that have this money. I, I wish I'd have bought a house when I was at my old job. I was making. 2020 was making W two income rates were low. Yeah, I probably really couldn't have afforded it all the way, but I would have had the income on paper to do it, and you know I would have made my rent no no other different. Right, I still had to pay my rent, still paying eighteen hundred bucks for a one bed apartment. I could have paid two thousand for a mortgage. I'd be in way better. So take it from me, if I could have bought three <laughs> years ago, I would have. Uh, I should have, and I'll tell myself that forever. Right, I wish I would have bought when I had the ability to. Uh, because, you know, got into real estate, I got away from my two years tax returns that automatically, you know, puts me at a disadvantage. And not only that, again, like we talked about, I'm self employed. So, you know, I don't want to pay Uncle Sam every dollar that I make. So we write off as much as we can, even though I'm making way more money than I did at my old W two job. I can't claim that much. Well, what held you back? I didn't understand real estate. Yeah, thing. it's yeah. fear, yeah. right? It's you fear. Know, and like, like that's what's so interesting to me is like you have buyers that it's almost like they talk themselves out of things. And I can't tell you, and I'm sure you'll agree with this. I cannot tell you how many people call me, ask for advice. And then when I, they, they admit like, I don't know what I'm doing. I need your help. You're the professional. What do I do? And then we tell them and they go, yeah, okay, I'm, I don't I think know. I'm gonna wait. <laughs> right. I'm gonna I'm wait till rates come down. Right. Yeah. It's like, did you want advice or did, were you just calling to vent? Were you just calling to vent? <laughs> um, you know, I mean, and that's that's what my guy that went in multiple offers, right? He came to me. He was like, "Look, you're the expert here. I want to buy a house. Let's make it happen." 
and we got it. We did it, right? We had to fight through a couple multiple offers, but we ended up getting him a house, and he's much better off because of that. Younger guy, you know, great opportunity to get into a place to build some equity here in South Austin, a great opportunity. I have friends on the other side of the fence who I know make the same amount of money or maybe more and have the money in the bank that they could buy it, but they're still sitting on the fence because they don't think it's the right time. I'm here to tell you, every day that passes is a worse time to buy than yesterday. Oh, for right? sure. Like you, if you could have bought yesterday or 10 years or extrapolated all the way out, right? If you could have bought it then, you should have. So you can't go back. So your next best option is to start right now. Yeah, no, I agree. And like I said, I mean, if you currently own a home, congratulations. And I think that's a little bit more of a debatable topic. And maybe that's something that we'll cover on another podcast. But yeah, if you do not own a home and you are paying rent, like what what are you doing? If call you're gonna call 20, me your James. If you're going to pay 25000 a year, regardless, right? I'm going to pay two grand a month in rent, or I'm going to pay two grand a month for a mortgage. This one throws the money down the toilet. This one puts a portion of it in the bank. Yep. And if you get lucky and the market turns around, well, then that's just like investing money in a, a little startup. gravy, you right? You know, you get a little extra on there. But this person doesn't matter. Up or down, you're throwing the money down the toilet. Sure. So what else you got for me? So if I'm a new buyer, we talked about the market. If I'm a new buyer, how do I make sure that I get the best deal? Not so much on the house. Because I'm, I'd be the person that would tell them that I'm coming to you as a lender. Mm -hmm. How do I make sure I get the best loan possible? Loan in terms of like cost or t in terms of loan type. That's my next question of what is the best kind of loan okay. or best kind of scenario. Well, let's first, let's cover them both. Yeah. So, you know, as far as loan type, I mean that one's pretty easy. You know, it's it's one of those things where y you ultimately have technically four types of loans, right? We've got USDA loans, we've got VA loans, we've got FHA loans, and then you've got conventional loans. And don't get me wrong, there's some creative financing, but for the majority of the buyers that we're dealing with, um, they yeah. usually fall into those One camps. Of those. So I get a lot of people that call me about USDA because, you know, it, it, it allows for no money down and everything along those lines. And when you really read about it, it sounds sexy. The reality is, is that USDA, they're very difficult only because it has to be a specific property in a specific zip code. So not it, it really follows almost like the home. The home itself has to qualify. And then it's one of these deals where you can make too much money to qualify. And then, of course, like any loan, you can make not too enough little. money mm -hmm. to qualify. I don't see a lot of USDA here in Austin. Obviously, outside of Austin, we run into it from time to time. Um, but to be honest, as far as... If I were to break it into percentages, USDA probably doesn't even tap into 5% of the business I see. Uh, that leaves us with FHA, conventional, and VA. So VA is only for veterans that, you know, have an honorable discharge. Uh, I do get phone calls from time to time that there's a, you know, misconception that maybe if your dad was a, you know, military vet or something like that. Um, unfortunately, you wouldn't qualify for something along those lines. The VA does offer loans for widowed uh, veterans that, you know, died in combat. So you wouldn't have to be a veteran in that case. But frankly, I don't run into that a lot. Mm -hmm. But yeah, if you if you served in the military and you have an honorable discharge, uh, they're great loans, man. They're the best. You know, no money down. Uh, the interest rates are super low. Um, you know, it's kind of a shame. I do sometimes see when we write offers with VA that sellers are a little hesitant to accept VA uh, because, in the past, VA had a lot more um, kind of just, yeah, hoops to jump through, stringent guidelines, and um, that's just not the case anymore, at least on the seller side. I mean, as an example, they've just recently, in the last couple of months, it might have been a year now, um, most VA loans require pest inspection. They want to make sure that there's no termites or anything that's along those lines. Right. They call it a wood-destroying insect inspection. And they used to have a guideline with the VA that, the veteran couldn't pay for it, and it was the responsibility of the seller. Mm -hmm. And these inspections only cost like $150, but you know just as well as I do in real estate how crazy people get. And when they find out after they've negotiated everything and they find out they have to pay $150 for an inspection, It'll some people just deal. like mm -hmm. blow their top. Mm -hmm. So now they've changed that guideline. So VA is just getting more and more lenient. Not The veteran can pay for the wood-destroying insect um, inspections so 
Moving on to the bulk of my deals, not my deals, I think deals in general in the country are conventional loans and FHA loans. So anytime that I meet with somebody to kind of determine which route I'm going to go, a conventional loan is ideal. That's really what you know you want, assuming you can qualify for it. And to be quite honest, it's what a real estate agent wants. It kind of gives indicators of what type of buyer that you're dealing with without saying anything, mm -hmm. right? So conventional loans ultimately are going to be, you know, beneficial to people with higher credit scores um, and people that are making a little more income because conventional loans have a slightly lower threshold in terms of debt to income ratio. What I mean by that is, you know, the amount of money that you're bringing in versus the payment of the mortgage and all of your credit card and car loan and installment expenses. So the first, the very first thing I do when I talk to a, a client, when we look at their credit, for example, we take a look and if the credit's, you know, great, my mind goes, all right, we kind of go down this conventional road, right? Mm -hmm. And then from there, we talk a little bit about their budget and what they're looking to purchase. And sometimes we run into situations where maybe one of the spouses is only going on the loan, but there's two parties in the house that are going to be making payments. Right. We have to keep one of the buyers off the home, whether it's because maybe they're, you know, they're self-employed and they're not claiming enough income or maybe their credit's going to hurt the transaction. And so they want to buy a house that technically is at the top of the budget for this one buyer. But together. But we know that they're both making the payments. Well, we might have to go FHA, FHA, even if you have a high credit score, because we want to tap into that higher ratio that FHA is going to allow us to oh, use. Shit, okay, okay. And I bring that scenario up because I think a lot of people, and, and this is for real estate agents, I think a lot of people, when they see FHA, it's like, whoop, strike one, right? Like you want to see conventional loan or cash, or cash <laughs> right? And then it's like, oh, FHA, strike one. Why do they have an FHA loan? Is their credit bad? Do they not make enough money? Like what's their problem? And sometimes it's somebody who makes enough money and has great credit. They're just at the top of their budget because they know that there's other people that are going to be making the payments. Um, so moving on, you know, if we have good credit and we've got good income, I'm absolutely going conventional every single time. One of the misconceptions I get about conventional loans is like, you know, as a first-time homebuyer, you're only required to put down 3%. Um, in fact, conventional is opening up stuff for down payment assistance even. So that's one of the things, you know, you don't have to put down 20%. Even if you're going conventional, it's it's something that people ask me. Um, but yeah, if, if credit's good and income's good, we're going conventional. If we need to tap into that higher income, we're going to go FHA, FHA. And then secondly, obviously, if the credit is slightly lower, and this is something I run into a lot as well. If you've got somebody maybe in like the lower 600 credit score range, they still qualify for a conventional loan. Conventional loans start at a 620 credit score. Mm -hmm. And I find that, you know, especially when it was super competitive, I unfortunately was watching people with like lower 600 credit scores take conventional loans with higher rates and higher PMI because they, because they could get the offer accepted. Right, because they were in fear of getting their offer accepted by a real estate agent that would kind of like blackball them for having an FHA okay. approval, mm -hmm. which is a shame because there's really not a big difference with conventional or FHA approvals f to the seller. The money comes in the whole lump right. sum to it's, the title company. Exactly. It's all same. it's all coming in U.S. dollars. So, <laughs> yeah. you know, and, and, and I'm not seeing as much of that anymore, which is great because it did it. It, it, it you know. I know it sounds cliche, but like as a lender, I do, I care, right? And I want to see people get the best deal. So you asked me, like, how do we get the best deal? Well, you know, again, if you have a 640 credit score, you can go conventional and sure, maybe it'll increase your chances of getting your offer accepted again, which is a shame that that's the case. But like FHA with the 640 buyer is going to be wildly less expensive in terms of a monthly payment for that buyer. And I have these conversations sometimes with listing agents where I call and I say, look, you know, I introduce myself and I say, listen, I know this is an FHA approval. I don't know if you're one of the 
real estate agents that, you know, is kind of like, yeah, frowning on this FHA approval. But let me explain and let me tell you what's going on. And if we have to go conventional because you're going to ultimately like mandate it, we can. But this FHA deal is going to be more beneficial for the buyer. So, like, let's do the right thing. Mm -hmm. Right. Like, let's not force somebody into a loan that's going to end up being more expensive because your sellers have some kind of misconception oh, yeah, that a conventional yeah. deal is going to be, you know, easier to get done. right or a smoother At the end transaction. Of the day, if you need a roof that's going to get replaced, a conventional loan is going to say the same thing. If the foundation's busted, right. conventional, you know, inspector is going to say the same thing. It's all about health and safety whether it's, you know, conventional or FHA, and that's the FHA. That's the misconception is that FHA is going to like start notating all of these things that's wrong with the property, but like you said, like if 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 a if an appraiser going FHA or conventional walks into a property and there's loose electrical wires hanging out, you know, at two year old child height, like it doesn't matter what kind of loan it is, yeah. the appraiser is required to go, hey, you know, we've got some safety issues here that, like, you know, we don't need dead children, take care of it, yeah. right? Like, and that it doesn't matter. So moving on to your next question, like, how do we get the best deal? In terms of costs, in terms of rates, and everything like that. I mean, for starters, the first thing in this market, especially, I would encourage every single buyer to do what they can to try to negotiate some sort of seller concessions uh, because they're available, right? And and there's no reason that they shouldn't be used because now we have an opportunity to take some of the money that can be, you know, uh, given as seller concessions from the seller to put towards closing costs. That's going to help you get a better deal. You can use it to buy down the interest rate if you like. Um, outside of that, as far as, you know, getting the best deal, I encourage clients to shop. But the only thing I will say, and this is something that I am, am, am I'm just shocked about, is there's a lot of ways with a loan to move around costs and move around, you know, we can put the rate here. It's like, don't look here, look over here. It's a shame, but it's the way that it is, right? And so what I encourage, this is my new public service announcement to real estate agents. Please, please, please start asking. If you know that you have a client that is shopping around, please ask them, hey, when you make a decision, can you please just send me the loan estimates from the, the sellers, or excuse me, the lenders that you're working with so that the real estate agent can review them? And here's why I say this. Your real estate agent has no skin in the game as far as what lender that you go to. Mm -hmm. And what's mind-blowing to me is I talk to clients that want to shop around, and I will send out my estimates, and sometimes they say, hey, you know, we've decided to go with another lender. And I say, hey, that's cool. Please send me over the estimate that you received because, well, first and foremost, I'd love to see if we can beat it. But the truth is, is a lot of times... I look at these loan estimates and I'm able to point things out that the buyer didn't see. I had a situation yesterday and gosh, I this is a big company, by the way, the mortgage company, and I wish that I could name their, <laughs> their name. Um, I had that exact same situation happen. The buyer had sent me over the loan estimate and the confusion that he had was he was under the impression that he was getting a 5.75% for $17,000 in closing costs. And when I had sent my estimate over, it was a six and a quarter, so a half a percent higher, with $17,000 cash to closing. And he said, you know, they're, they're the same as you in terms of cost, and they're a half a percent lower, so Matt, I love you, but I gotta go with them. And I said, hey, no worries, I would never tell a client to move forward with me if we weren't giving them the best deal. But please send over your loan estimate. He sends it over, and the lender is charging him $17,000 just in their costs. To get that and then you have title, taxes, insurance, all of the transfer fees, and his total cash to close was like thirty two grand, where my total cash to close was seventeen. And I said, look, you know, if you want this 575, that's fine. I can get it for you. And we raised his costs on my end a little bit, mm -hmm. right? But now, instead of him bringing $32,000 total, 17 going to the lender and the rest going to title taxes and insurance, 32 all in, 
we were able to have him bring twenty thousand dollars, twelve grand less. less for the exact same thing. And so, thank God for this guy that he liked me enough to send me that because what I run into all the time is it's like, send me your estimate. And it's almost like buyers. I don't know if they're mad at me. I don't know if they're just so tired of shopping, but I'm like, please send me over the estimate. They're like, nah, we're good. Like I I sometimes feel like, or maybe I just get, take it too personal. It's (laughs) like, I sometimes feel like they're like, nah, we're good. We, we, we've decided to go with this other lender. We're not sending anything over to you because you tried to screw us, right? Like you're more expensive. And it's just not like that. And so my new thing is, is that your real estate agent has no skin in the game when it comes to your loan. So please, 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 for what it's worth, I know your real estate agent knows more on how to read a loan estimate than you do. Don't take it personal. It's just the way that it is. And if you're not going to forward competitors' loan estimates to your loan officers that you're working with, then at least send them over to your real estate agent because you don't buy homes nearly as much Mm -hmm. as we are in these transactions i mean you know personally i'm do we do 10 to 12 transactions a month now i'm not personally buying these homes but like i basically buy 10 homes a month right right? like i am involved in in 10 10 transactions Mm. every month 120 transactions a year like and you do one every five right like so it's like you know as a buyer it's not your fault like you don't do ten, ten, ten you transactions don't know what you a month. You don't know, right. right? I mean, like, hey, this one said seventeen thousand. This one said seventeen thousand, but this rate's lower. But what, you not having the real estate experience, you don't understand that the word closing cost and the word cash to close two are two, d- two totally, totally different things. And unless you've looked through tens, twenty, thirty, fifty, hundreds of loan estimates, you're not going to spot that difference because all you see. The numbers look kind of the same, but this one has a better rate, so I'm just going to go with that one. But you're right. I mean, there's so many ways that a lender can bake in a cost to get something lower. Well, and it's a shame. you know. I To, to your point with the closing cost thing, I feel like I ran into this last week, and of course – you know, random buyer, if you're out there, call me like, you know, because what ended up happening is the exact same thing where I swear to God, buyers call up and ask, what are your closing costs? And these lenders go, oh, well, we don't have any costs. Right. So like as a buyer, I get how confusing this is. And it drives me mad because, yes, I don't charge title fees. Yes, I'm not collecting for your taxes. And, and all of the other fees that are associated with a purchase. But I kind of feel like it's my responsibility because I know what you're asking me as a mm-hmm. buyer when you're like, what are your what are the closing costs? Like, well, what are my closing costs? Like, you know, like right. and this is what happened with this situation. I, I guarantee it where this lender went, oh, our costs are seventeen thousand. Well, the total cost, the way they had it set up was thirty two. It's a totally different number. Yeah, so it's double. just like it's like, well, what question are you asking me? And I know what it is. And and these lenders, they tiptoe around it. And it's like, again, I I run into lenders all the time that are like, oh, we charge no lender fees. Like, okay, so are you saying that there's no costs associated with the loan? And then even then, oh, so what? You just don't charge any fees, so you don't make any money. Yeah, like, yeah. How how do you have a, a company that survives right. and has employees, and you charge zero dollars for your right? Service? We all know it's baked into the interest rate. Yeah. And, you know, nobody works for free. Profit is not a dirty word. So, And you muddy, muddy waters make for easy prey. Yep. And, unfortunately, there are just a lot of people out there that are willing to do that. And that's, yeah. that's the crappy part, um, you know, and most of the time those people have their way of doing business and they get business done, so they stick around, and that's the worst part. You would hope that people who intentionally confuse folks or, you know, tell them partial truths, right? Because they're not necessarily telling you a lie. Exactly. That that's that's how that's how they sleep at night. Yeah, you know, yeah, the omission of yeah, a fact isn't a lie. Their cost is only 17000 but what they should have said, well, ours is seventeen plus the title is 15, and that's going to run you about 32. Right. You know? So, yeah, muddy waters make for easy prey. There's going to be people out there swimming. Go to somebody that you trust. Build a relationship with somebody, somebody that's going to look out for your best interest. And – the easiest way to check the numbers is have somebody else look at it. If it's not another lender, have your real estate agent look at it. If you got a CPA, have them look at it. You know, somebody who is in the business of reviewing and crunching numbers and know what's what and how to tell this from that, 
because again, you don't do this every day. You don't do it for a living. You do it once and you move on with your life. And even if you had all the same questions five years ago when you bought, the chances that you remembered all of that, everything that you learned through that whole six month transaction five years ago, you're not gonna remember everything. Or you're gonna be stressed out. You're gonna have a long day at work and you're just gonna check through something because you just don't care that much today. Well, or because you looked at 10 other estimates. Like, and they all blend together. Yeah. Well, and that's my point to these agents. You know, if you're out there listening, please, please, if you have a buyer that's shopping around like crazy, because, again, I'm not a real estate agent, and maybe you can attest to this, but a lot of these, you know, what I call, like, online lenders, they're terrible at their job, and they and and they usually end up being the least expensive. And so you as a real estate agent, we all know – we want it to be a good experience, mm -hmm. right? So the only thing I would suggest to make your life easier too is if you've got somebody who's shopping around and they're working with a lender that you don't know, you want to make sure that you're looking at that loan estimate for them, making sure that everything is what it needs to be because I'm sure you've seen it happen. You know, good, aid, good real estate agents have preferred lenders. They refer them out. And then all of a sudden they're like, yeah, they're going with another company. They move forward with a company you've never worked with, you don't know, that's in Omaha, Nebraska or something crazy, and you have this horrible experience with this lender. You have a helpline only. You don't have anybody to talk to. Right. You send 10 emails. Don't get a response. Yeah. So I'm saying to real estate agents, be selfish. Do it for don't. If you're not going to do it for your buyer, do it for yourself. Because it's a headache. Right. Yeah. yeah. And last thing you want to do, because you know I'm a big proponent on control what you can control. And if you have a way to make not only the buyer's experience better, but your experience better and helping them and making your job a little bit easier. You know, as a real estate agent, find a lender that you can trust that you know is looking out for both your clients because they're their clients too, not just how many numbers can I put on the books this month? Right. How many phone calls did I have to make to make my 10 deals or whatever and charge the lowest fees just so I can hit my quota? That's not the person you want. You want somebody who you know cares about people. You know, that's why I have a great relationship with you. And I, you know, send as many folks as I can to your work because I know you take care Appreciate of people. Appreciate you. You know, you take care of folks. And that matters way more than the hundred dollars that they're looking at or right. that they may stand to save. If like you always tell me, if you're not gonna buy a house over 150 bucks, then you probably shouldn't be buying a house in the first place. Right. You you, you either weren't <laughs> in it or you can't afford it. Right. Yeah. If you can't afford that 150 bucks for your sanity and to save a few years on your life right because mm -hmm. stress we know what stress does it's going to shorten your lifespan that matters way more than a couple hundred bucks totally so. well we're 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 at the time and uh if there's anything you want to say to the people or whatever to get you know content out go right ahead man. Yeah. We'll, we'll we'll edit it and clip it for you yeah yeah um you know first and foremost right uh james with the Lone Wolf realty group at Coldwell banker we are here to help you uh, I love South Austin. If you're trying to get into South Austin, you know, please hit me up. At the end of the day, though, if you're somebody and you can't afford to buy, now is the time. Rates are still high, so there's still not a bunch of buyers in, but that's slowly changing. I'm looking at the stats today. In March, days on market was 60. Now it's 40. What does that tell you? People are buying homes faster. Homes are going faster. It's going to keep going that way, and as rates get more lower which is what you're looking for as rates gets lower more buyers come it's going to be way more competitive and we don't have the supply so if you're on the fence and you have the money and you have the credit to buy now is the time don't wait for rates to get better don't wait because your mom said that next year is going to be a better time for everybody if you have the ability make the choice make the jump get some skin in the game and you will thank me later boom